please turn our phones on silence. It's super helpful. I'm going to assume most of you have been to this building before. We'll start with some housekeeping. There's a restroom uh, diagonally across and down the hall. Um, these two or three rows are going to be leaving at some point because it's a class. So if you see a bunch of students get up and go ask how to fire drill, it's okay. It's planned. Um, I think that's the key housekeeping. So, wow, amazing crowd. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Todd Levasseur. Uh, I'm the director of our Sustainability Literacy Institute, the home of the college's quality enhancement plan, uh, sustainability literacy as a bridge to addressing 21st century problems. And through this program that I direct, um, the college has pledged to give you students interdisciplinary problem-solving skills around social, environmental, economic systems. So social, environmental, economic systems is also called the triple bottom line of sustainability. And so since sustainability is such a big, broad concept, we have a focusing mechanism each year, a CFC sustained solves theme. So last year, our theme was water issues. Um, this year, our theme is social justice, fair distribution. Next year, we'll be looking at food security issues. And the year after that, we'll be looking at global warming and climate change. And the hope is that you all as students, whether you're graduate or undergraduate, over four or five years at the college, you see these themes are actually interconnected. Right? So the social, environmental, economic aspects of all these themes they all relate. So you can't talk about issues of gender if you don't talk about issues of water access. And you can't talk about water access if we don't talk about climate change and incoming droughts. And then we can't talk about how do we get food supply if we're not talking about do we have enough water and then who's doing the migrant labor for food. And it all starts pulling together and time together. And so you as students, we want you to understand these social environmental economic systems, how they're interconnected, and how to solve problems around them. Um, and so Maud is our guest speaker today. She's going to be talking specifically about water. So I invited her here last year. She wasn't able to make it. So she's providing a bridge this year with this year's theme of social justice and fair distribution, and last year's theme of water. And this ties into our Year of Women programming as well. Um, definitely want to thank, um, and some of them are in the room, uh, the Dean of our Languages, Culture, World Affair School, uh, the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dean of School of Arts, Dean of School of Education, Health, Human Performance, and the Dean of School of Science and Math. All of them helped put in some money to get Maud here, as did the Sustainability Literacy Institute. Um, I have this up for now. Maud is not going to show PowerPoint, but just a background of Maud. So this, are, uh, these, this is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And there's, what is it, 16 or 17 total? <coughs> and so all of them relate very closely to what I was just talking about. Um, this one is, as it says, ensure access to water and sanitation. Right? So a, a recognition that water is a human right. right? Every, every human should have access to clean, abundant water. Well, Maude helped write this at the UN level. So Maude has partnered with, worked at the UN. Uh, she's traveled the world looking at issues of water privatization. Um, she told me early, great line, she's been tear gas on every continent, doing activist protest work around water rights, um, empowering women in issues of water. She is one of Canada's leading uh, environmentalists, but it's larger than just, just that term, really sustainability activists working very closely right now with indigenous First Nations peoples on the front lines of trying to keep um, tar sand pipelines from being built in Alberta. Um, so working on reducing CO2 emissions out of Canada. So working very closely with frontline First Nations people. Um, and so many, an author uh, wrote Blue Gold, which is one of the first books sort of raising awareness of the global water crisis. Um, they say, last century the war was over oil. This century the wars will be fought over water. <coughs> So Maud's been on the front line of trying to raise awareness about these issues, providing equitable access to everybody around issues of water, making sure water's clean. Um, so I'm really thankful that you're here to share your wisdom with our students. So there'll be a talk followed by question and answer. So please do wait around. So after the talk, there'll be some time for question and answer. But please do help me welcome Maud to campus. Thank you very much, Todd, and can you hear me? I um, don't have quite as, as far-reaching a voice, but we can't seem to get the mics working, so we'll just have to do this. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I live in Ottawa, Canada, and the snow is this deep this year, and I actually thought, oh, Charleston, sunshine, warmth. Oh, it was cold last night, uh, but uh, I'll go home just in time for it to get nice and warm here, but I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the issue of water, um, but also the human right to water, which is something I've been deeply involved in. I, in Canada, I'm uh, the chairperson of a national environmental and social justice organization. We're very grassroots oriented, and we work a lot with youth and indigenous people, environmental groups, and so on. <clears throat> I also do a lot of work internationally, putting together an international 
uh, water justice movement. So it's, uh, my life is crazy and I have, yes, been in, in fact tear gassed on every continent and I really want you all to put that on your bucket list. It's really <laughs> very important to uh, take some chances in life. I'm going to try to convince you that the issue of water is um, at least as important as climate change as we've come to understand climate change, put it a different way. People will often say, well, climate change, <coughs> greenhouse gas-induced climate change is responsible for the following things, and it, it's all, water gets um, wrapped into that. So, and of course, there is a huge impact on water when, when we have these extremes and all that we know about what, what climate change and climate chaos is doing to water. But separately from that, I want to convince you that what we're doing in mismanagement, displacement, abuse, over-extraction of water is actually one of the causes of climate chaos. And the restoration of watersheds and the restoration of what cares for watersheds, which is uh, wetlands and forests and, <clears throat> and decent soil and so on, can be one of the solutions. So I really want us to get that in our heads, but I also want to get it into our heads collectively. Two more things. One is that we have a global crisis on water. And the second is we can do something about it. We're not too late. This is not an issue that's gone beyond our ability to do something. So just, I'm going to take you out in the world a little bit, <clears throat> then I'm going to come back to the United States and then a little more locally, and then talk to you about things people can do. I don't have a PowerPoint. I only use PowerPoint when I have to give a presentation in French so I can pretend my French is better than it is. <laughs> and so there are basically two major crises that we're dealing with when we talk about water. The first is ecological. Now this is something that's counterintuitive because we all learned as kids, and we're still learning it in school, that the world can't run out of water. We will remember that we had those back in grade five or six or whatever, those diagrams that showed the hydrologic cycle and the water goes round and round, and it's not only the same amount of water, it's the same water that was here when the dinosaurs were here and so on, so we can't destroy it. Well, wrong. Not true. We have to get rid of that right away. The, the, what we're dealing with now, the UN calls the scourge of, scourge of the earth. The UN reports that the demand for water will increase by 55% over the next 15 years. But by that time, global water resources will only meet about 60% of the demand. Now try to figure what we're talking about. We're talking about a, water, uh, a world, a planet running out of clean water. This is a recipe for disaster. Today, 3.6 billion people live in areas of water shortage in the world. And this could rise to 5 billion, 5, 5 billion, not million, in 30 years and 7 billion in 50 years. We're not just talking climate change here. We're talking about the demand for water going straight up and the supply of clean, accessible water going straight down. Uh, we know that Africa, uh, India, the Middle East, Australia are all slated uh, for severe water crises. Uh, Australia's government just announced about two months ago, let's face it, we're in permanent drought, let's stop pretending this thing is cyclical. <clears throat> but we really need to look to, ch to countries that have lot lots of water, like my own, Canada, and your own. Um, and countries like China and Brazil that have a great deal of water but are destroying it. In China, if you can believe this, over half of the rivers have disappeared since uh, 1990. Half of the major rivers are gone. They've been over-extracted to make all of the, I don't know, pillowcases and rubber duckies and everything for the world, right? Um, and Brazil is another country that never had any record of drought in Brazil. Um, they have just, it's a hugely water-rich country, but in the last uh, several decades, they've had massive drought in the south because they're cutting down the Amazon very, very quickly. And the Amazon rainforest, like all forests, gives off a great deal of water vapor. And the vapors get caught in what are called flying rivers. Um, these are the atmospheric rivers that carry the water, the rain, far, far away. And every year, you know, rain all over um, southern Brazil. And every year, they can count on a huge <coughs> amount of, of, of rain. They're cutting down the forest so quickly. The scientists are saying not only is this causing drought in Brazil, it's causing drought. They say the taking down of the rainforest is causing drought as far as Texas and California. And as I say, it's not just climate change. We're depleting, we're polluting, we're degrading, um, and we're over-extracting, particularly over-extracting groundwater far faster than any um, system really can, it, can, uh, can care for it. So we're taking the groundwater out of the ground faster than nature can replenish it. So it's really important for us to get an idea or a notion 
that we have taken water for granted. Um, we, I call it the myth of abundance. We were taught, as I said earlier, that you can't run out, so we can do whatever we want to it, and it'll still be there. This is uh, my speech to you today. If you remember nothing, you must remember this, that that's not true. We've got to stop doing this. So there's, of course, that's the ecological, uh, environmental reality, but there's also a human reality, and that is that the lack of clean access to water and sanitation is the greatest human rights abuse of our time, if you're just looking at straight numbers of who's hurt. Um, and it's about to get much worse as you have the, uh, again, this twin problems of growing poverty and people doing without many things, not just water in certain parts of the world, but then receding water tables. And this is what happened in Cape Town, South Africa, in the last few years. You probably remember the last year they were talking about the day that the water was going to run out in Cape Town. Well, they took pretty extreme measures and they put that off for now. But they have this, what I call, perfect storm of incredible poverty, people not having access to water as it is now, um, and but um, having these water tables depleting so that not only do you have this deep inequality, which has been there, uh, I guess, you know, as we know for many, many years, uh, but now is exa exacerbated by this lack of water. Currently, two billion people, this is a World Health Organization study that just came out, have to drink contaminated water every day, and 2.5 billion have no access to sanitation. I was in one slum in, uh, in India, uh, in, uh, 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 just outside of one of the, the big um, cities, and 500 people, 5,000 people, excuse me, technically, share a toilet there. Well, you can imagine that's not, um, that's not true. Uh, most, close to 3 million people, uh, mostly children under 5, die of waterborne disease every year. More than half the hospital beds on earth are filled with people suffering from this condition. The lack of clean water kills more children in our world than all forms of violence uh, together, including war. <clears throat> so we have this twin crisis, and it's coming. It's not just in the global sense, and this is one of the incredibly important messages that I want to bring to you today. Even water-rich America has many crises. The Ogallala Aquifer is the aquifer that goes down the spine of the, of the western uh, United States. It used to be the size of Lake Huron, the, the groundwater, uh, the, 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 the uh, yeah, one of the great lakes. Um, and it's just a shadow of its former self. They have 200,000 <coughs> deep wells operating 24-7 and people talk about what they call planned depletion. <clears throat> it's due to run dry in our lifetime. And this is the Ogallala Aquifer pr provides a great deal of the food that people eat in the United States every day, but they also export massive amounts of it. A man named William Ashworth wrote a fabulous book called Ogallala Blue, and he talked about how they discovered these circular um, <clears throat> rotating uh, deep well bore wells in the 1950s and they turned the area from basically desert into this paradise, this uh, oasis where they uh, are now producing huge amounts of corn, particularly for corn ethanol. He says that groundwater mining was not only, not only became a way of life and gave people incredible riches, but it's become a way of death because it will absolutely run out in our lifetime. There's a new national study in this country that was done by multiple universities that warns us that groundwater in the U.S. is way more shallow than previously thought of. In fact, about half of what was estimated by scientists. And this is really interesting because normally when they're uh, assessing what, how much groundwater there is, they <clears throat> examine how fast the water tables are falling in previous studies. Uh, these researchers looked at, the, uh, the, but in this study, they looked at water chemistry to determine um, what the quality of the deep groundwater was. And they found out that, of course, as we know, that salt water and contamination uh, is seeping into much of our groundwater. So you may, you, we may know that it's this deep, but you can't assume that you can uh, access water beyond, below a certain level. So they say we only have in this country about half the amount of, uh, of groundwater that we thought we had. And what are we doing to these groundwater reserves? Well, there are more than 680,000 legal underground waste injection sites in the United States. And more than 150,000 150, legal waste injection sites shoot chemical-laden industrial uh, you know, waste, industrial fluids, thousands of feet below the Earth's surface into deep groundwater systems. 
the records are being kept, but there's basically very little uh, information on, on how much they're leaking into our drinking water, and there is absolutely no federal oversight of this practice. Out of sight, out of mind. I'm reminded of reading of this um, scientist, this engineer, who took the first cup of water when they found a, a reserve of groundwater under Mexico City, and Mexico City is sinking. I don't know if you've been there, but you kind of look at the big churches, and they all kind of are on their side. It's called subsidence because the water table under them has been has been removed and basically everything sinking. Um, so finding this groundwater site was very important. So he took a cup and he drank it and he said, this is why you take care of your groundwater, because one day you're going to need it. This notion that you could just dump anything you want into it is just absolutely not true. Um, <clears throat> so we know that we we are treating our, we're over extracting groundwater that, and we're polluting groundwater thinking that we, we have unlimited sources. We do not. And as well, there's a fracking frenzy here. Since 2005, there have been over 140,000 fracking wells drilled or permitted in, uh, in the United States with many more on the books. Each one contains as many as 600 chemicals, many of them carcinogenic. Uh, we know this from a whole variety of studies now. And of course, fracking not only uses a great deal of water, but it pollutes, contaminates a great deal of water. Uh, California is the most hydrologically altered landmass on the planet and has destroyed much of its wetlands and forests that protected the traditional watersheds. A new study is predicting a very sharp increase between the bouts of deep drought and extreme rain, which we've just seen in California in the last few days, including these uh, uh, cycles, one following the other. Climate change, of course, means more water vapor in the air, which means more water stored in atmospheric rivers, these rivers I was telling you about um, from Brazil, which means more violent precipitation followed by longer periods of drought. And we always hear, well, can't you, can't they capture that precipitation when, when there are mudslides or whatever? But no, because if the soil is hardened and destroyed from, from a chemical overuse, the water isn't seeping into, into the ground the way it needs to be. And the Great Lakes are in trouble. The Great Lakes uh, are, as you know, a very important source of water for North America. It produces a great deal of our food. We have invasive species. We have warming of the waters. Lake Erie is, is they say it may be dying again, this, this uh, eutrophication, which is the runoff, the nutrient runoff, mostly from factory farms, um, is back, just <coughs> covering parts of the lake every summer with blue-green algae. <coughs> And the global study of water taking around the world said that if the Great Lakes are being mined, the groundwater is being extracted at the same rate as the global rate, and I quote you, I quote this and you'll say, well, I never heard of that, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years. This isn't me saying this, this is a group of international scientists who did a study of, wa of groundwater extraction around the world. Now, if you've ever stood on the, on the, on the shores of one of the Great Lakes, the concept that this could be gone is just crazy. Except when you read about the Aral Sea, which was a lake in the formal, former Soviet Union that was so big, it was the fourth largest lake in the world. It was so big they called it a sea, the Aral Sea. It's basically gone. Over, not climate change, over-extracted <coughs> forgotten production in the, in the desert and just over-extracted for whatever they, they needed it for. At least 40 U.S. states will fare, face serious water shortages in the next 10 years, says the U.S. Government Accountability Office, due to decreased water supply and increased water demand. So we're talking 40 of the 50 states are already, they're already it's already been mapped and predicted um, where this is going to happen and how much, uh, in which areas. And much of your country's water infrastructure was built just after World War II, and it's wearing out, basically. They, desperately needs uh, infrastructure rebuilding. Every year there are 240,000 water main breaks that leak two trillion gallons of drinking water um, into the streets and waterways and so on that could be caught and captured with <coughs> infrastructure rebuilding. Since peaking in 1977, federal funding for water infrastructure has been cut by 75%. So we really are talking about a kind of, you know, hands-off water, we don't care about it, we're not going to protect it, we're going to, it's a free-for-all, anybody can do what they want. So, we're, and we're also facing water rates uh, going up, there's actually soaring. Over the last 15 years, American water bills have increased 
by uh, seven times the rate of inflation, whereas household incomes have fallen. So we're actually, when we think about people not being able to pay their water bills, we tend to think of countries in the global south, but not so, that's happening um, here. So we're facing what I call a perfect, I'm, I'm good if you're good. You sure? Yeah, fine. Okay. We're facing what I call a perfect storm of declining, this is in the first world, this is here in the United States, I'm not talking in poor countries now. We're facing a perfect storm of declining water supplies, rising poverty levels, and climbing water rates. And so you have a situation where people who can't afford it are actually getting their water cut off. Tens of thousands of people have had their water cut off in Detroit, Michigan. And it's happening in Baltimore, Boston, other, other major uh, cities where we have this growing amount of poverty. Detroit's a very sad city and a city that really speaks to the issue of environmental racism. Um, inner city Detroit was decimated when the car industry went down. I would say because of NAFTA, but anyway, I won't get into that. Um, and a lot of money moved out of Detroit and a lot of people moved out of Detroit because of money. And what they left behind was a largely African-American population, poorer, elderly, um, and without many without jobs. And suddenly, they didn't have the tax base for to be able to pay the to, to run the water system. So they they just doubled and then tripled the price of water uh, for people in that city, and people couldn't pay it. Literally, couldn't pay it. So then they started coming in and turning the water off. Water cutoffs by the tens of thousands. It started about four years ago, and I remember coming up to Detroit up for me because I'm over it. Um, and down, sorry, <clears throat> and really having this incredible set of meetings with people and saying, this is just awful. I mean, this is like what happens in poor communities around the world. I can't imagine this happening in, in wealthy America. And they said, well, it's, you know, we, we think it's a form of racism because we don't think people care. So I remember talking to the rapporteur, special rapporteur from the United Nations, and she came and brought the rapporteur on, on food and the special rapporteur on housing, and she had, they did an, ex, uh, an examination, they talked to many people, they did a whole set of researches, and they held a press conference and they said that the United States and this, the state of Michigan and the, the city of Detroit were, were violating the human right uh, of their people uh, with these cutoffs, and so we, suddenly did get media actually around the world because this is really quite a startling uh, statement. But I think I want you to know this because this is happening here now. This isn't just happening in places far away. Uh, and the protection of America's water heritage is in serious jeopardy right now. I'm not talking politically, whatever your politics are, I'm, I'm not asking, I am, this is fact though, that the, no, Donald Trump has cut the Great Lakes restoration uh, fund by 97 percent. They may as well be gone. And he recently announced the biggest rollback of the Clean Water Act since it was implemented in 1972. <clears throat> so we are seeing an incredible rollback of the protections of water um, in this country at the very time when we should be doing just the opposite, given what I've just been talking about here. So your own community, Charleston here, what are the issues? Well, we had this huge rain uh, yesterday and today. And we know that the sea level rise and the flooding is probably the most important immediate issue that you guys are facing because you're one of the coastal communities that is going to be affected by, by climate change. Uh, but we also have an issue of sustainability. Simply put, and all the studies here say this, that residents and industry are, like many parts of the world and certainly all over the United States, are taking out water faster than it can be replenished by nature. Again, particularly the groundwater. Surface water supplies here in, in South Carolina are shrinking and groundwater extraction is in a bit of a free-for-all uh, with monitoring, yes, but little policing being done uh, of the permit. So it's kind of like anyone who asks for a permit is getting it. The Department of Health and Environmental Control is understaffed, in, as, as I understand it, and um, not being given the, the kind of support it needs. Without action, without setting priorities for access, serious water shortages are in the future of this state and this community, um, as well as uh, pollution and demand for water, the pollution that we're, com we're committing and the demand for water that is going to grow. And one of the things that I really advise communities like this, and particularly in a, at a state level, is to set 
criteria for access to water. Who should be having access to your groundwater or to your raw, what they call raw water? Um, I worked with the folks in Vermont to help them write their legislation because they had very clear public trust legislation protecting their surface water, but nothing for their groundwater. Um, and so we actually came up with language that said that in times of shortage or any kind of competition or con concern, that water for people's needs comes first, water for ecosystem protection comes second, and water for, for local food production rather than food production for export um, is really important. And that's an issue that needs to be discussed everywhere. I mean, as you probably know, in California, Central Valley, they're growing you know, most of the almonds and many other things for that, that they export around the world. So they're using the remaining uh, amount of water in California to grow products to make some big farmers get rich. And meanwhile, we have this dichotomy with uh, local small uh, food producers not being able to access the water they need. Now, what's the solution to this crisis? Well, <clears throat> I would offer to you that we need to set some criteria, some value criteria. And I think that's very much in keeping with the theme of what we're doing here today, talking about the human right to water or inequality in general. So the first one that I would suggest to you is that water is a human right. And you might say to me, well, that is a motherhood. That's a given. Of course it's a human right. And I'd say to you, yo, yeah, you should see the fight that we had at the United Nations to get the United Nations to recognize the right to water. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did not include water because at the time nobody thought of it as an issue of human rights. But for the last two decades, we've been pushing, pushing, pushing to get the United Nations to formally recognize that water is a human right. And this is very important because if you think of it as a commodity, then you can say, well, it's a need, and a need can be taken care of by uh, the, a for-profit system or governments or whatever. Um, and if you think of it as a need, you don't see it, you think of it as a charity issue as opposed to a justice issue. But what is seen as a human right, and it's recognized by all of the countries of the world as a human right, then, it, then it's a matter of justice. And people can say, this is my human right, you have no right. You know, I, do not, I don't have to watch my child die of waterborne disease because I don't have the money to pay for it. This is my fundamental human right, and it really changes the lens on the political discussion we're having. So denying people or communities clean water and sanitation is a violation of their human rights. 2010, we finally got the United Nations uh, General Assembly to recognize the human right to water and sanitation. I was there, I was a nervous wreck um, because we thought we weren't gonna get it. All the, the World Bank was against it, big parts of the UN were against it, my country opposed, your country opposed, Great Britain opposed. The big um, bottling water companies opposed, the big for-profit service company, water service companies opposed it, and we thought we were going to lose. And I was up in the balcony the day that it happened, and I was with my staff, and they were in tears, and we're going to lose, and I was saying, it's okay, because we'll be back in two years or five years or whatever, and we'll get it, because I'm very determined, right? So the way they voted the UN, and the general, so this is all the countries, right? This is the General Assembly. They sit in a big General Assembly hall, it's gorgeous and they vote at their desk, so it comes up right away on a great big electronic chart, so right away you know. So there we are, absolutely expecting we're gonna lose 141 countries vote in favor. Uh, no countries oppose, even the US and Canada, which were out there vocally opposing it, they, they abstained, 41 countries abstained. And after it was over, the guy, a wonderful man named Pablo Solo, who was the ambassador from Bolivia to the United Nations, had given a wonderful speech. He stood up and he said, every three and a half seconds, a child in the global south dies of waterborne disease. And he held up his fingers like that. And you could literally could have heard a pin drop. And so nobody could vote against that, right? So <clears throat> he came up to the balcony to be with us when the vote happened, because all the activists were up in the balcony. And after they voted, a number of the ambassadors turned to him and were going, you know, furious. You, we weren't ready for this, and why did you force us to do it? And Pablo's standing there with this big shit-eating grin on his face as if to say, and what part of, I just won and you didn't? It's not clear here. It was just one of those sweet, sweet moments. And in my opinion, the human family took an evolutionary step forward when this happened. And you should know that your country that year 
um, joined the Human Rights Council at the UN, and two months after this happened, changed its, its position and came out totally in favor of the human right for, for, uh, for water, the, the <coughs> concept. So this is a big thing, because the US often doesn't do that. The US often uh, uh, sets up parallel, uh, introduces its own parallel legislation at home. So it was a big deal. And now, almost four dozen countries have either amended their constitution or brought in a separate new law recognizing the human right to water. Uh, here in the US, governments now have the obligation to ensure clear, clean, drinking water to their people, and I would really like people to start using this obligation and really enforcing it. Uh, this means no more cutoffs to people who cannot afford it. Yeah, if you decided that you don't want to pay your water bill, but you have the money, that's different. If you can't afford it, you cannot have your water shut off. That's a violation of the human right to water. It also means adopting or enforcing strict laws about what we put in our waterways. We are far too lax with chemicals and toxins we dump particularly into our groundwater. And if you think I'm just talking about the US, my last book was on how bad Canada is and how we dump chemicals into our water. And so believe me, I'm, I'm more critical of my own government than I am uh, of yours. But it does mean that we need the law. Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. And we really do need to maintain the Clean Water Act. We need to introduce new and, and better and more uh, um, uh, stringent laws around uh, protecting water. It must be seen as a kind of violation to each other. It's a, hu it's a health violation if we put chemicals in the water that come back to haunt us. And don't think groundwater and surface water are separated. It's all kind of one moving body of water. It's like putting poison in a, a piece of your blood, or one place in your blood, and thinking it's not going to move. It's going to move. It also means serious investment in water infrastructure, and I don't know if you guys know about the Water Act. It's called the Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability Act. It was introduced a couple of years ago. It's been revised and it's being reintroduced, I think, in about a week um, in both Congress and the Senate. It would create a water trust fund and provide $35 billion a year to drinking water and wastewater improvements across the country toward the goal of clean, safe drinking water for all Americans. The Water Act would address the persistent chemical pollution in affected areas. It would prioritize getting the lead out of the drinking water in homes and schools. It would help small rural and indigenous communities and create close to a million jobs. Um, I think supporting this legislation is a crucial step in, in, in getting to the human right to water. So that's the first of the, my my three principles. The second is that water is a public trust. Now trust me, there's a great big fight going on out in the world about who controls water. Is it a commodity to be put on the open market for sale like oil and gas, or is it a human right and a, and a commons? Is it something that we all own together? And there are very different views on this. Uh, business schools and many corporations around the world teach that the best way to deal with the crisis I've described is put it out on the market and let the market decide. Well, that will help decide things, but it will also kill many, many, many millions more of people. And I can't imagine thinking of what will happen to the environment if it can't afford itself, if you see what I mean. If, if, if it's all about the market, then how are we going to protect nature and watersheds in their natural form? Um, when this happens, water gets go uh, governed by the profit motive, um, subvert subverting uh, the right to water and protection uh, and protection of the, of the world's uh, dwindling water sources gets compromised. There's a guy named Peter Brabeck. He's just um, resigned or retired from being the CEO of Nestle, which is the biggest bottled water company in the world. And he said the, the notion of water as a human right was ridiculous. Now he says, okay, well, I'm all hard. I would put 1.5% of the world's water aside for the poor, and everything else goes on the market. You know, so. So we're fighting the privatization of water services. That's where a municipality hands over its running of its services, either wastewater or sewage or, or drinking water, to private companies. And we know we've got study after study. They're way more expensive. They cut corners. They increase uh, to increase their profits. They raise water rates always. Uh, and we get poorer service from them. Food and Water Watch, which is a group, if any of you want to know more about all of this, you can go to their website. 
found that for-profit water service charged 59% more for drinking water services and 63% more for sewage services than public water companies. So if you want the human right to water and you want everyone to have it, you've got to keep those rates down. And the way to do that is to take the profit motive out of the delivery. I'm not saying there isn't a place for the private sector, but not in the delivery or, or the decision about who gets access to water. Uh, the World Bank and the big water utilities are aggressively promoting water privatization in the global south. There's a city and, and a region called Cochabamba in Bolivia, and they had one of the first water wars back in the 1990s, the late 90s. The World Bank had come in and said, okay, we're going to give you money for water services, but you have to take this private company, Bechtel it was, <clears throat> and they're going to set up a water company. And the first thing the company did was triple the price of water. Well, it's an indigenous, largely indigenous uh, country, community. They couldn't afford it. And then the company said, oh, and by the way, we own the rain coming from the clouds. So if we <clears throat> find you hoarding or gathering this water, we're going to find you. So there was an uprising, and uh, the people rose up. They brought the army in. People were killed. I mean, it was a real water war. And the people won. <clears throat> the World Bank was forced to retreat, and the company uh, was forced as well. But uh, I at once asked a man named Oscar Oliveira, who was um, the man who led this fight. He was a shoemaker. He'd never been outside of his city, never done anything like this in his life. He got tear gassed a lot this time. <laughs> Um, and I said to him, why water? What is it about water? Because there have been so many other issues in your, in your world. And he said, I'll never forget this. <clears throat> he said, because I'd rather die of a bullet than thirst, which I think is a really powerful statement, right? But the tide is turning on many, many cities in the, in the world, including Atlanta and a number here in the U.S., um, have decided no privatization. And Baltimore recently banned the private, privatization of water services altogether. And we also have water trading that's growing. We have something called water pollution trading, which is where you can pollute water, but you can pay your way out or trade your way out of having to deal with it. There are many ways in which we can look at the destruction of water as being something profitable for those who want to profit from it. And so we're talking about this thing called the public trust doctrine, which says that water is a common heritage of all humanity, all future generations, and must be protected in um, public trust in law forever. Um, and that means that it can't be bought or sold or hoarded uh, on the open market. So it's really important that we have an understanding, this understanding that it's a public trust. So that's the second. And the third is that watersheds have to be protected and restored. Water has rights outside of its uh, relationship to us. I don't know if any of you have heard of the whole concept of the rights of nature, but this is a very, it's kind of a new and a very old thing. Um, that came out of a meeting that a bunch of us also had in Bolivia after the failure of the Copenhagen uh, summit, uh, climate summit in 2015, um, um, I guess, uh, 13. And we all came together in Bolivia and we came up with this declaration on the, the, the rights of Mother Earth, basically mirroring the human right, the Declaration of Human Rights, but saying the Earth has rights too, and that we have to think about how to change our laws and apply our laws in ways that recognize nature's laws. Because right now, nature is property, water is property, and you can only get compensation for something if you can prove that your property was damaged. Well, what about if the heritage of your children, you know, the natural heritage, the heritage of the, the species and the, the fish and the, the animals that live there, Nobody's speaking for them. So we really need to think about how, how we can change this. Uh, and we need to stop seeing water as a resource. It's the essential element of a living ecosystem. We need to uh, protect our groundwater. We need to stop the, con the legal contamination of the shared heritage. We need stricter rules on how we produce food and the chemical stews that it, the way we produce food is, is streaming into our lakes and, lakes and rivers. Uh, we need much stricter laws on chemicals, insecticides, herbicides used to uh, produce our food that, as I say, are, are contaminating our waters. And we have to deal, have to deal with the flagrant use and abuse of plastic. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie The Graduate. It was a movie when I was a kid. And he turns to D young Dustin Hoffman and he says, son, you want to make money in the future? 
and boy oh boy was, was he right, is there ever a lot. A million plastic bottles are bought around the world every minute. A million plastic bottles are bought around the world every minute. We will be, produce, be producing half a trillion plastic, single-use plastic bottles by 2020, within a year. If you place them to end to end, each year's supply that we're producing of these single plastic bottles would reach over halfway to the sun. It comes back to where are we putting them? Well, guess what? A stunning, uh, this is an international st uh, statistic, 91% of all plastic bottles do not get recycled. They end up on the planet somewhere. They end up in our forests and our streams and our lakes and our oceans. Um, and we know it takes 400 years for them to break down. Plastic has now been found in human waste. And they think it may be in our bloodstream as well. When you're eating fish, you're probably eating plastic particles. So we need to do something about this. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to stop soon. I want to tell you about one wonderful project and then just end with um, a message of hope. This project is called Blue Communities. We started it in Canada to get municipalities, cities, to declare themselves a blue community, but it's gone ballistic and it's all over Europe now and I want it to start to come here. A blue community, uh, as, a, as a municipality or university, whatever, promises to protect and promote water as a human right. It promises to protect it as a public trust, so it must be held in for the commons. And it, 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 and it promises to not ban, but uh, phase out uh, bottled water on its premises. If you've got clean water coming from your tap, um, or you can provide the, the refillables, which you have out here, that you will no longer have, um, you'll no longer be providing bottled water. People want to bring it onto campus, that's their business, but you're not, so you're not banning it, but you're not providing it. And we have municipalities around the world now, we just, I was just in Berlin, which had sold its water to a private company and then for 10 years of activism they got it back and now they've become a blue community because they don't want it to happen again. Paris is a blue community, uh, Madrid's about to become a blue community, but the big thing that started to happen is that other than municipalities, uh, institutions are becoming blue communities and a number of universities in, in, in Europe have decided to be, uh, become blue communities and it's a, it's a positive thing you can do. It's not. I don't know if any of you are activists in this room, but as activists, we're often against a lot of things, you know. You're against everything. Um, and this may, lets you be for something very, very exciting. and lets us put forward a set of values, and you could include it. It doesn't have to stop with these three principles. You can include something local that, that is really part of how you see what the, the issues are for you. So I'd love anybody who wants to talk about this university or your city becoming a blue community, please let me know. We'd love to work with you. So finally, I'm just going to share my great worry and my great dream with you. Um, my great worry is that there is great potential for growing conflict and competition <coughs> and even violence in our world as the water, waters of the world become more scarce. Water disputes are lo looming between nations, between rich and poor, between small farmers and agribusiness, and between thirsty megacities and rural communities and indigenous peoples. And I'm telling you, I've written, I've studied it, I've written about it. There are decisions being made now where governments and leaders say, this limited amount of water is going to this industrial zone, or this uh, export zone, or this resort, or this swimming pool, and you know, golf courses, and these communities are just going to die. And we, are sorry, but there isn't enough for everyone. Uh, Pope Francis said, I ask myself, if in this piecemeal third world war that we are living through, <coughs> we are not going towards a great war for water. So this is my worry. But just as water can become a source of division, it can bring people, communities, and nations together in the shared search for solutions. Water survival is going to mean we have to work with each other. It's going to mean, in certain communities, it's going to mean either we kill each other or we work together because there isn't enough for all of us unless we come together to protect and share it. There's a wonderful example in the Middle East where all of the troubles are that we know, where groups of people from uh, Palestine and Israel and Lebanon and other, uh, and other communities have come together to protect the Jordan River, to clean it up and to protect it. Um, and they work with each other, and there's one 
place where they actually took the wall down, part of the wall down between them because the families had become so close in, in, in putting this together. We need a new water ethic that puts water protection and water justice at the heart of all our policy and practice and of the notion of, of equality and justice. So my great dream is if we do it right, water can become nature's gift to teach us how to live more lightly on the earth and in peace and respect with one another. Um, I really believe with all my heart that this is the moment, you guys, being young, you got the whole world in front of you and um, become an activist. I, you don't have to choose my issue. Climate change has got many faces. <laughs> Equality issues have many faces, but it's really important that you care about something beyond yourselves. And I know, I'm sure I'm talking to people who do care, or you wouldn't be here beyond yourselves. But it's really, it gets you up in the morning. It keeps you healthy, I swear that I believe that. Um, and as a 95-year-old friend of mine says, when people get tired and worn out and worn down, and she says, oh, you cut that out. She says, you know, fighting for justice is, you." You know, you do it every day, and when she gets really mad at us, she says, oh, fighting for justice is like taking a bath. You do it every day or you stink. <laughs> <laughs> so I would really urge you to say that this is, um, this is an incredible time uh, to come together, because I've never seen a time with so many exciting movements using technology, finding each other in the way that we are, coming together. Um, to truly believe and make it real that another world is possible. So I, I thank you and I'm really happy to discuss all of this with you. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So got some time for question and answers. I'll start with students first. So students with some questions. Too shy. On the spot. Just Too selfish. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, students think, faculty, or anybody in the room at this point, have privileged students first. Let me go with some questions for Mark. Yes, I can use her. Yes. So, uh, you talked briefly about the water bills and the billing injustices that occur. Uh, kind of interested to see your take on water pricing as a whole. Yes. Because from talking with practitioners and uh, city managers, there seems to be a disagreement on who's actually responsible for the water once it leaves the <coughs> treatment facilities to get you know, uh, deployed out to the communities. So who should be paying for that infrastructure? And is that something that is going to be needing to be reflected in the water bills, or is that just a separate tax? Because as, as, you, as you know, we're trying to keep prices down, but then there's infrastructure needs that need to be in place. Um, so we can just kind of start there. Thank you. What a fabulous question. Did everybody hear it about water pricing and, and who pays for water? First of all, um, when we talk about water services, service charges, that to me is different than people buying water. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. different than commodification. It's a service charge for a service.